Hello, my name is Nick Bray. I'm a software engineer, and I'm working on Native Client. This is, unfortunately, where dinner parties get a little awkward. So, Nick, what's Native Client? I, it's a developer thing. It's part of Chrome. I work on Chrome. <sighs> that, that's usually a fairly soul-crushing thing. But fortunately, this isn't a dinner party, and we can talk about interesting things. So when I say interesting, what I mean is you get to drink from the fire hose. So we're going to be discussing address space. We're going to be discussing instructions, assembly language, that kind of thing. I will try to make sure everyone can follow along, even if you don't have a huge amount of background in this. But we're going to get into the nitty-gritty technical details of how Native Client works. Uh, before we do this, of course, the only kind thing to do is give a bit of an overview and say how this fits in, why we're doing it, what's important here. So one big thing we keep saying is that Native Client allows native code to be safe and secure as JavaScript. And this is a very kind of very compressed tagline, which unless you actually know what's going on behind the scenes, eh, you aren't quite sure what that means. So one picture is worth a thousand words, and this is a picture which you probably are familiar with, is whenever you try to run a piece of native code on a computer, you get a scary dialog box, or run from the web. So say someone tries to install an NPAPI plugin on your computer, or you even download an EXE from the internet and try to run it, well, the operating system is typically skeptical of any binary which is coming from the network and says, hey, wait, you probably shouldn't do this, but eh, what do I know? You can do it anyways. Uh, so the problem with this is that most users really cannot evaluate whether they should click run or not. And you sometimes lose 60, 90% of your users when they get this dialog box. And even if they do hit run, then suddenly a lot of burden is on you. The burden becomes on you as the developer to make sure that this piece of native code you installed on your customer system is actually safe and secure and doesn't become an attack vector where someone exploits your customers because you made a mistake. So native code, understandably, is very scary, especially when you get these dialog boxes. Uh, so does the story end there? Native client, should we be doing this? As it turns out, it isn't native code itself which is the problem. It's the fact that my presentation has not been refreshed and the bullet points aren't fading in. Hold on a second. Okay, back in business. So the problem is that the operating system has a very different notion of security than the web does. So say I'm browsing a website to watch videos of cats, because that's what we all do, we just don't admit it. And then suddenly I notice my tax return being uploaded to a Russian website. So this right here is a Windows API call to open a file. So really, this Russian website does not need my tax return in order for me to watch videos of cats, so there's something seriously wrong here. But as it turns out, operating systems are secure. They just think that any program running on your computer is acting on your behalf. So because you can open your own spreadsheet, it assumes that any native program should have access to it. The web, the web figured out this is probably not the way things should run when you're loading other people's programs. So instead, they say that the program is operating on behalf of the website. And it should only do things which you authorize the website to do. What this means, of course, is that if you load native code and it can talk to the operating system, it can just blow right past the browser. And that is the fundamental problem with native code, is it can do things that your web browser says is unsafe. Another problem, which isn't immediately apparent, is this is a Windows API call to open a file. And imagine if you are, say, writing a nice application to view cat videos, which also happens to upload files. Well, suddenly you have a cross-platform support issue, is you can open the files on Windows, but, well, are you going to support Mac builds? Are you going to support Linux builds? I mean, honestly, when you're writing malware, it becomes a huge problem. Of course, there's some honest developers who have the same problem, and that's when I distribute native code, how do I make sure it actually runs on all the operating systems out there? Another thing, again, which isn't immediately obvious, is this is a synchronous call. A lot of operating system APIs were designed back in the days where synchronous blocking of things was, eh, seemed like a good idea. But with the advent of browsers and JavaScript, a decision was made to eliminate the use of threads for the most part within a single JavaScript environment, a single document. And instead, everything was single threaded with asynchronous callbacks. So APIs have had to change in order to support the web. Whenever you open a file on the web, you in fact give it a callback call you back. So the big crux of native client is making you talk to the web browser 
instead of talking to the operating system, and in fact making it impossible to talk to the operating system. So this is an example of what a native program talking to the web browser would look like. It's a little ugly, but it's from real code, and well, real code is ugly. So this is an example of doing a URL request to get the page www.google.com. It's analogous to what we were seeing with opening a file, but it's a different API, and it's routed through the browser. So Native Client provides a bunch of APIs for I.O. that are mediated through the browser through an API called the Pepper Plugin API. The Pepper Plugin API you can think of as a successor to the Netscape Plugin API, where things we've learned in the meantime, such as 3D graphics are good, have been incorporated, and instead of just drawing to a random window, you can now delegate to the browser and say, here's some 3D content, just like WebGL. So ultimately, the Pepper Plugin API gives you a lot of functionality similar to JavaScript. As you can think, all the APIs that JavaScript has to open URLs, to draw 3D content, it's also exposed to native code through Pepper. Not everything is I.O. So if you want to spin up a thread or do things like that, that actually occurs within a single process. You don't need to talk to the browser, don't need its approval. And for that, we do use the POSIX API. So you can spawn threads and do similar things. So if your code's running on Linux, you can port the I.O. to uh, use Pepper, and more or less everything else should look relatively the same. And why are we doing this? The ultimate goal is no scary dialog box. You can just run the code, it follows the web safety rules so you don't have to warn the user. It's part of a seamless experience, and in fact, most users won't know they're running NACL. We have a lot of games in the web store now, which, you know, we aren't trumpeting NACL, it's just you can run Bastion on your computer now. So the life cycle of a native client application uh, has three distinct stages. The first stage is what the developer does on their computer. So you can get a bunch of sources, uh, existing library, or say you've written a game and you want to port the game, run it on the web. Uh, you do some porting work on your C files, and then you use a modified version of GCC, which we provide. There's one wrinkle in this, and that's that you need to use a version of GCC that uh, targets binaries for different platforms, so, or different architectures, I should say, chip architectures. So the binaries that are produced are OS independent, but at, uh, for the moment they have a uh, architecture, an instruction architecture set dependency. So for this talk, I'm going to show you the internals for the x86-64 sandboxing model, and you can think that the x86-32 and the ARM sandboxing models are quite similar. Uh, the details differ, but spiritually they're the same. Uh, at the end of the year, we're gonna have a product called Pinnacle. Uh, I should have defined this a little earlier. When I say NACL, I mean native client, and I've just used this term so much, I use it automatically. So I need to make very sure that everyone knows, I mean native client. So Pinnacle, portable native client, Pinnacle, is going to use an LLVM-based tool chain, which will allow you to ship bit code, platform independent bit code across the wire, and they'll get translated to whatever architecture you want to use on the computer. So that'll be roughly the end of the year. And at the bottom level, what we're going to talk about today remains the same. So the interchange format will change, but the sandboxing model, the inner mechanics, is going to stay the same. So this modified version of GCC outputs code which we can later statically analyze. And we'll get into what this is. We call it validation. Once you compile this code, you upload it to a web server, just like a normal web app. In fact, it looks a lot like a normal web app, as you have an HTML file, you can have JavaScript, you can have CSS. And then within that app, you have an embed tag somewhere. And the embed tag pulls in the native client executable, and it can talk with the rest of the web page. So you can make a UI with uh, HTML elements. And finally, at the end, there's the user. The user is running a browser on their computer. The browser loads the page, loads the embed tag, pulls in the native client executable. So the question to ask at this point is where's the security? Ultimately, the user wants to say that this application I'm running on the network isn't gonna harm my computer. So how are we able to make that assertion? We actually can't say that about the compiler. So the compiler tries to output code which we can verify is safe, but we don't trust it because at the end of the day, who knows what the developer is intending? They could just have an arbitrary binary blob that they put together with a hex editor, and when the user gets it, they have to look at it and verify it's safe before they run it. And similarly, even if it isn't malicious, compilers have bugs. So GCC, LLVM, very complex pieces of software, they were not written with safety in mind to begin with. 
So saying that these compilers are gonna produce perfect code, that's a bad assumption to make. Instead, on the web browser, we look at the code before we run it and apply some simple rules to try to verify it's safe, rather than saying this big complicated piece of software is where the safety is. When Native Client actually runs Inexi, the process model looks a little bit like this. So what you think of as the web browser, what you see is called the browser process. And that's just a normal application running on your computer talking with the OS. But every time Chrome visits a new domain, it usually splits it off into its own process and says there is a render process for this specific site which can do all the JavaScript execution, all the rendering of the DOM, and we're gonna try to keep sites separate. So if one site is compromised, it rattles around in its own process and has a much harder time attacking another site, stealing your credentials from your banking system or things like that. So these render processes run in something called the Chrome Sandbox. The Chrome Sandbox, you can think of it as deprivileging the processes. It says, hey, if these processes ask, ask for your tax return, that's probably a bad idea, so don't trust them, don't give it to them. So you'd think that this solves most of the problems for NACL, but as it turns out, uh, we're following a pattern called defense in depth, is that we try to build layers, each of which is secure on its own, and if one of those layers fails, the other should catch the problem. And there's actually some subtle problems with the sandbox I'm not gonna get fully into, but uh, Native Client tries to provide an inner sandbox inside its own process, so when you have an embed tag in the web page, instead of running the native client executable inside the render process, it spins up yet another s process and then applies the inner sandbox to make sure it never can, or we try to make sure it can never do anything bad. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the inner sandbox. I'm going to be talking about what happens in the NACL process. Now there's a lot of little pieces that build up to, uh, in order for us to verify that the process isn't talking with the operating system, or more correctly, the code that's loaded across the network is not talking directly with the operating system, and we can do very controlled calls to provide services that are needed. So the first step in this journey is being able to understand what code we have. So you'd think this is easy. You've done assembly language, you see a lot of instructions, and we just look at the instructions and say, Bad instruction, we're not running it, end of the story. However, computers see the world in a different way than humans usually do, and that's that native code is a stream of bytes. And they start executing the stream of bytes, pull in bytes, execute, pull in more bytes, execute. And if we really wanna understand what the processor is doing, we have to disassemble the code. We have to look at it from the CPU's point of view and see what it's going to execute. So, before we get into why this is a little difficult, the question is what are we looking for? What instructions do we not want to execute? Uh, the first one, which I've been harping on, is syscall. So syscall, uh, just as a convention, on the right I will have the bytes that these instructions compile into. So syscall is a two byte instruction, and what this does is it says, hey operating system, I want, it, I want you to provide a service for me. And without the outer sandbox, without the Chrome sandbox, there's very obvious problems here is that you can open files, do all sorts of bad things. But even with the Chrome sandbox, there's still a lot of problems. So there's a recently uh, publicized vulnerability in the Intel implementation of the x86-64 architecture where the sys exit return, so when the operating system returned from a syscall, if you set it up in such a clever way, you could cause it to overwrite arbitrary memory inside the operating system and result in a um, exploit where you could escalate privileges in the operating system. So the silicon itself allowed an attack on the operating system. The bottom line is we simply do not want to make these calls. These calls are the gateway to the operating system, they are an attack surface, so even if we're in a GD privilege process, we don't want to make them in the first place. Another interesting instruction, this is actually a fairly old example but famous, is the FOOF instruction. The uh, foof instruction, because, called because it starts with F-O-O-F, had this na nasty habit of actually freezing your entire computer when executed on an older Pentium. So under the hood, what was going on is it applied a lock and then it tried to execute an invalid instruction and it never recovered and unlocked. So your entire CPU hung up. So if you talk to some security people, they'll say, eh, this isn't really a security vulnerability because well, you know, you aren't losing your bank account information to some random hacker. 
But if you think about it from a web perspective, do you really want to surf to a web page and have to power cycle your computer? It's bad. So there is these classes of instructions that, again, we want to blacklist and say, if we encounter these in an executable, obviously the person's up to no good. So syscalls, foof instructions, we're not going to mess with them and just reject the binary outright and not run it. So there's a third class of instruction, which is a little weird. And uh, if you just look at this instruction, all it does is multiply a bunch of numbers together. Perfectly safe. There's no problem with this. Well, as it turns out, the one wrinkle here is that this is part of a new instruction set, the SSE4 instruction set. So if you're running on a computer that doesn't support this instruction set, what happens when you try to execute it? So in theory, it should just halt the process, but has everyone really tested every invalid instruction possible on every chip? So instead of running this risk, instead what we do when we encounter it, instead of rejecting the program, we simply write over it with halt instructions. So a well-formed uh, executable should not try to execute this instruction if it's not supported. But if it does, because we overrid it with halt instructions, that causes the execution to stop when it encounters it, just like it theoretically should if the instruction was not supported by the processor. So overall, native client is looking for a variety of instructions that wants to say either don't run the program or overwrite this to be sure that we're safe. So how do we find these instructions? That's the crucial step. So previously I said it's a stream of bytes and you're taking chunks out of the stream of bytes as you go and that's nice until you realize that you aren't just going in one direction. You can occasionally hit a jump, they'll take you somewhere else in the execution and it could be an arbitrary byte. So there's two classes of jumps we're gonna deal with. One is direct jumps, jumps where you know the address that you're going to and indirect jumps where your address is calculated from data and you may not know exactly where you're going through up front. So here's an example of a problematic direct jump. So two instructions here. The first instruction loads a constant into a register. Now this is a strange constant, but we'll assume the programmer knows what they're doing and they have some reason for that constant. And then the next instruction jumps backwards four bytes. So the, now on the surface, this should be okay, uh, but the fundamental problem is that the move instruction right before the jump backwards is five bytes. So you're actually jumping back into the middle of the move instruction. So if we look at how the processor sees this, instead of how our human eyes see the assembly instruction, the first instru uh, first sees the byte B8 and says, oh, B8, that's a move constant into EAX instruction. And then there's gonna be four bytes following it, which define a constant. So it happily pulls out the constant, moves in the register, goes on. Then it says, oh, there's a jump backwards four bytes. It's actually a jump backwards six bytes because the processor calculates from the end of the instruction, whereas the assembly language calculates from the beginning. Just a detail, but some people may find it a little confusing. So you jump backwards four bytes, and then the processor happily starts executing what it previously treated as a constant. So it says, oh, OF05, hey, that's a syscall, let me do a syscall. And then suddenly you get owned. And then it sees a jump, which nicely takes you out past the previous jump, and you go on with your normal execution. So in one single instruction, we managed to smuggle in two additional instructions which just entirely compromised your system. So a native client doesn't play this game. If it ever detects a program trying to jump into what it previously thought was an instruction, it says, I'm not gonna run this program. I'm not gonna touch it. Obviously, you're doing something sketchy. So if you generate code like this, we don't run it. The other class of jumps are indirect jumps. These are a little harder because you don't know exactly where you're going, so how do we tell if we're jumping inside an instruction or not? So this is a C example of where indirect jumps come in. You take a function pointer, you call the function pointer. So if you look at the assembly language, this is a very simplified, assuming you have an aggressive optimizing compiler, is you do a direct call to a known address, which we don't know what it is, so it's not fully disassembled, and then the return value ends up in RAX, the register, and then you say, yeah, just call that, whatever it is. So if we were being aggressive, we could do some deep analysis, try to figure out what the pointer could possibly point to, but that's hard, that's expensive. So instead, a much simpler thing to do is look at individual, the individual instructions and say, can we infer from the sequence if what we're doing is safe? So what we're saying is that this function pointer could be a random number for all we care. Can we make jumping to a random number safe? Can we make sure that jumping to a random number doesn't get us inside an instruction? 
So the first step, which may not make sense until you see the second step, is any pointer, any function pointer, any instruction pointer that we're going to jump to, we first put a mask on it. And that mask says, drop the lower five bits, set the lower five bits to zero. So how does this help us out? What it means is that instead of being able to jump anywhere, we can instead jump to every 32 bytes, one thirty-second of everywhere. And this doesn't, this isn't immediately obvious how it improves our lot. But we modify the compiler, right? So we can tell the compiler that instead of having instructions that could move over or lap over the 32-byte boundaries, any time you would potentially emit an instruction that overlaps the boundary, nudge it down a little bit. Stick in extra operations that do nothing, and then we know that any time you do an indirect jump to a 32-byte boundary, you will be hitting the start of an instruction instead of the middle of an instruction. So the mask allows you to jump to known safe locations, even if you don't know what those locations are. Here's a more concrete example. Here's that funky move again with that constant. And if you generated it so that it overlapped the 32-byte boundary, an indirect jump could again execute the syscall because it would do, go to a mod32 address, see the OF05, and boom, there goes your tax return. So instead, uh, the validation algorithm require, would reject this because it overlaps the boundary. Instead, the compiler would generate this extra no operation and move the instruction down. So the combination of not allowing direct jumps inside that instruction and making sure that no instructions overlap 32-byte boundaries allow you to know where all the control flow in your program is going. Aha, you say, but I'm a clever hacker. I can modify the code after you validate it. So validation just happens at the beginning. We say, we'll look at the code. If it's good to go, we'll let you run the code. So to prevent code modification, we say any time we have a chunk of data, which represents code, it's going to be readable and executable, but you don't have the permissions to write it. So everything that goes through the validator, once we know what it does, we make sure it keeps doing what we know it does. Aha, you say, but uh, what about things that aren't code? So I can just do a buffer overflow somewhere, jump to that buffer overflow, start executing it, and I just executed code you haven't validated. Well, again, every piece of data we make sure can be read and written, but not executed. So this plugs the hole for self-modifying code. So I just lied to you, and that's that things can change after the initial setup of the program. So you can load dynamic libraries, you can have just-in-time compilers which emit new code, and actually modify the code in very controlled ways. But how you do that is kind of complicated because you need to make sure that if there's multiple threads, you never get kind of memory decoherency where you execute an instruction which is in the middle of being modified. At the end of this presentation, I'll have a link to the research papers, so if you're really interested in how we do memory-safe code modification, you can read up or ask me afterwards, but for this presentation, we're going to ignore this rather large, ugly issue. Another thing is that mProtect is now security critical. So syscalls, we thought about all the damage we could do with them, but now we can start doing indirect damage, like unprotecting a page, writing it, then boom, we're executing code that is invalid. Similarly, there's other syscalls like git process ID, not immediately obvious why they're dangerous, but they can use, be used to escalate attacks by knowing where you're going from. So the name of the game is whitelisting, only allowing functionality we know is safe instead of saying, meh, do a syscall, whatever. So that's the basics of how we allow code to be decompiled. And if you actually start looking at how this affects calling and returning a function, there's some interesting things that get shaken out. So I'm going to do in the reverse. I'm gonna show how you return from a function, then I'm going to show how you call it, because the return impacts the call. So usually returning from a function is a single instruction. Return. Pops an address off the stack, jumps to that address, and you're back to where you called from. So you could call the same func function from multiple places, so the call records where you called from on the stack in order to be able to return to it. But implicitly, this is an indirect jump. So a malicious program could stick a random number on the stack and then jump instead of calling to the function, and then when the function returned, who knows where you are. So there is a type of exploit called return-oriented programming, which uses this kind of thing where the returns can be repurposed for jumping to arbitrary locations. So we can try to fix this. We can manually pop the return address off the stack, mask it, just like we showed for indirect jumps, 
push it back on the stack, and then return. So problem solved. Well, no. I mentioned threads earlier, and threads are a big problem because there could be another thread in the background trying to smash the stack. And so between the moment where you push the address on the stack and when you return, the memory could get changed out from under you, and you could end up anywhere, who knows where. So we can't really trust any addresses in memory. We can only trust addresses in registers. So what this means is that in order to return, we can't use the return instruction. We pop off the stack, mask it, and then jump to the address. This has a few consequences, like branch prediction is a little harder, and we're using more bytes to do the same operation. So I mentioned earlier that the sandboxing schemes for different architectures were different, and this is largely due to the fact that we are trying to minimize the cost and tailor to each architecture. So we try to keep the number of bytes per sandbox instruction as low as possible through being horrendously clever about how we mask things. And if you want to talk about this, again, we can talk about it afterwards about clever instruction encodings. So return, a very basic instruction, is actually dangerous because it's doing an indirect jump to a, uh, a memory location based in, or to a location from memory. So bad idea, we have to do it explicitly. So whenever we have masks, it becomes critical that we don't bypass the mask. So we may have two instructions, the mask and then the jump, but if there's some other jump which goes between the instructions, it doesn't actually violate what I talked previously. You know, I said you can't jump into an instruction, but if you jump between these two instructions that are critical for safety, suddenly you just stripped off the mask, the entire security model fails, and you have a problem. We call these pseudo-instructions. So whenever we have a sequence of instructions, which is security critical, we say, treat it just like it was an instruction. So direct jumps cannot jump inside a pseudo-instruction. Indirect jumps cannot jump inside a pseudo-instruction, which means that the entire pseudo-instruction has to not cross a 32-byte boundary. We, uh, just as a terminology, we call this bundling. So what does this mean for calling a function? If you just call it like you expected, just from a middle of a bundle somewhere, you do the call, you know, you see the mask here, you see the indirect jump, and then where do you return to? The problem is, is that the mask drops the lower five bits of the address, so you aren't returning to the address that was pushed on the stack if those lower bits were not all zeros. So you end up returning to the beginning of the bundle where the call was from, and this is obviously not what you want. This starts to look a bit like an infinite loop, unless you account for it. Where you really want it to return is immediately after the instruction. So the workaround for this is that whenever you have a call, you pat it down to the very end of the bundle. And this means that the return address is at the beginning of the very next bundle. So when you mask it, when you drop the lower five bits, it doesn't change it at all. So all the instructions, all, all these uh, instruction sequences that we're showing, in fact, should not change the correctness of the program. They are simply there for the validator to say, oh, yep, I can prove that this is safe, and if somehow garbage data gets in here, I know that I'm going to be jumping to a known place. But in normal operation, the compiler will stick everything on 32-byte aligned boundaries that we need to jump to indirectly. Okay, so yet again, I lied. I seem to be a serial liar here. I apologize. And that's, there's more going on in the process than just this bit of code. We can validate a lot of code, but as it turns out, there's other code and data in the process that we don't fully control. It needs to be there so we can use it. So we have a world where we have a single process with code we don't trust and code that we do trust. So this is the general uh, view of what I've shown so far is there's untrusted code and untrusted data. And what I mean by untrusted is this code is coming from somewhere across the wire, and instead of having to have this dialog box that says, well, you're running at your own risk, instead we validate it, and then we say this conforms to our rules, so we'll run it without having to place trust in it. We will enforce the security instead of trusting. So untrusted code, untrusted data. Well. Every time you launch a process, the operating system likes to stick in some code so that you can talk with the operating system. And we could do something really nasty, like try to overwrite this, kick it out, but we're gonna need it eventually. You know, we're gonna need to do something. Simply living within the sandbox isn't enough, so down the road we're gonna need to talk to uh, 
the NTDLL on Windows, for instance, but we don't want the untrusted code to do it. Similarly, we're gonna be talking with the web browser, so the easiest way to do this is load the DLL for the web browser in the process. So we can call the same functionality to talk between processes that Chrome uses. There's also trusted data. So when we're running the sandbox, we have to keep track of things like where code is mapped, because if the untrusted code says, well, there's actually no code there, so why don't you map code there again, then we could get weird overwrites, partial instructions. So there's bookkeeping data. And if you could clobber that data, if you could go there and say, overwrite the table for where all the code is, then the untrusted code could start doing, again, very bad things. What we need to do is we need to make sure all the execution and all the data access that can be done directly by the untrusted code only happens within a confined region that doesn't include NTDLL, that doesn't include Chrome DLL, that doesn't include any bit of code or data which could be used as an exploit. So on 64-bit systems, this is a four gigabyte range of memory, and we reserve one of the registers, R15, to point to the bottom of this range. So one of our security critical properties is that R15 cannot be overwritten by the untrusted code. So as the validator goes through, it looks for anything that can modify R15, and if something does, it goes, nope, not gonna deal with it. A thing you may note also is that this is a four gigabyte range, which happens to be two to the 32, which allows us to do some horrendously clever stuff to make our masking as small as possible. We'll get into that in a second. So here's a scenario that we have to worry about. What happens when the untrusted code tries to jump outside the sandbox? So it can't do a direct jump outside this constrained range because the validator can't see the target. And because it can't see the target, it can't tell whether it's in the middle of instruction, so it says no. But it could do an indirect jump. So it could do an indirect jump to a 32-byte aligned boundary somewhere in NTADLL, and we have to allow this because you could be loading shared libraries. So you may not know where the code is before you load it. So in, what we have to do is we have to make sure that indirect jumps only fall within this constrained range. So how do we do that? We have to confine the jumps to the four gigabyte range. Here's an example, it's just an empty function. What's, in, what's happening implicitly here, however, is that it's returning. And as we went through all these explanations, this is what a return eventually looks like, is there's this masked indirect jump back to wherever you came from. But this could go into NTDLL, how do we fix it? So we confine it by masking it and dropping the upper 32 bits. So we boil it down to a 32-bit address, then we add the offset, and then we actually use that. So I remember I was saying horrendously clever. This is not really self-promotion. This is when I was doing this presentation, I had to work through exactly how these instructions worked. It's actually pretty interesting. So the and right here is doing a 32-bit operation on a register, and then later the register is being used as a 64-bit value. So doing the 32-bit operation implicitly zeroes the upper bits, and this allows the actual AND to be packed down into a single byte data. So it says it's going to be E0 sign extended, and then I'll implicitly drop the upper 32 bits because it's a 32-bit operation. Then you do a full 64-bit add and a full 64-bit jump. So the cost of this is about eight bytes as opposed to two bytes. So there's a bit of overhead for doing it this way, but we know where it's going. We know it's only gonna be within the confined region, and we know it's only gonna be to a 32-byte boundary, and we know there's gonna be no instructions that are overlapping those 32-byte boundaries. Next thing to worry about is reading and writing bits of data that are outside this confined range. Writing is obviously a problem. If you can write something, you can change it, you can control it, makes attacks much easier. Reading? Debatably, it's not an attack, but this can be used to uh, help attacks. So if you can poke around memory, find where things are, then you can do much more controlled jumps, much more dangerous uh, intended actions than just jumping around randomly. So how do we confine data access? Here's an example of a C function, is that we're just taking a function pointer and we're writing a constant to that pointer wherever it may be. Thus far, we haven't talked about sandboxing writes at all. So the Intel instruction for doing this just says move this constant to whatever, wherever the memory address points to. So to sandbox it, we do something similar to jumps. We mask it by moving a 32-bit register to itself. So again, we rely on the implicit zeroing of the upper bits, but since we don't need to discard the lower bits, you know, it's just a move. 
simple enough. And then we do a complicated addressing mode, which actually adds R15 simultaneously with, with moving the, the constant to the address that's computed. So this move instruction is saying, uh, add R15 to RAX and then multiply RAX by one, and there you go. Instead of six bytes to do this move constant, we got nine bytes, not too bad. There's a little curious thing here, though, is there's that multiplier. So we know that RAX is a 32-bit value, but that multiplier can be up to eight. So we aren't actually operating within a four gigabyte range. We're potentially doing a write to eight times four gigabytes. And there was ways that you can rack it up even further with constant offsets. So we could tweak this a little harder and do the mask and get rid of the multiplications, but sometimes compilers just like to generate these. And the more features you get rid of, the slower the code's gonna be. So instead of trying to do instruction sequences that are safer, we actually say, well, 40 to 44 gigabytes um, on either side of this confined range, we're gonna mark as we own it. So you can't use it. So you aren't actually allocating the memory. You're just marking it as no one gets this memory but us. And it's illegal to read, it's illegal to write, it's illegal to jump to, it doesn't exist. So if you can do a uh, memory access, which is outside this four gigabyte range, you get caught by the guard region. And that's how we allow these addressing modes. And just kind of as a funny side note, sometimes we get people benchmarking native client and say, you take over 80 gigabytes of memory. And we're like, uh, do you have over 80 gigabytes of memory? But really what they're looking at is they're looking at address space usage rather than actual memory usage. So we can't do anything fun. We can just go inside the sandbox. How do we get out? How do we actually request the URL, like I showed in the beginning of this presentation? To do that, at the bottom of the sandbox, native client inserts a bit of code called the trampoline. Now the trampoline is code that would not normally be validated, but allows you to do a controlled jump outside the sandbox. So there's a trampoline entry for each service we provide, such as spawning threads, and when you want that, you jump to the trampoline, and the trampoline jumps you out into Chrome DLL, where we provide an implementation for that. So the set of trampoline calls you have, which are analogous to syscalls, are the same on every platform. So in one swoop, we are providing a cross-platform API and controlling exactly what services the native code gets. The trampoline itself, again, is small, but in some ways overly clever. And we take a constant address, stick it in a register, and then call that address. And there's a few things going on here. One is that we do the move into the register instead of doing a, a um, direct call so that it's easier to patch the code, as we know exactly the address we're going to. And in fact, we can make that address the same for all the trampolines. So if you have multiple trampolines going to the same place, since direct jumps are relative, you'd have to do a lot of math and make sure that you're jumping to the right address. But here we just jump to a constant address. Another thing is that it's a call instead of a jump so we can have a trace of where the syscall's coming from. So we know, oh, we're going through trampoline four, therefore we know what service we're getting. And then finally at the end there's a halt. So even though we're doing a call, we never return to where we called from. It's just a method to trace the address of where we came from. So if anyone returns from inside the system code, it's gonna hit the halt and it's gonna prevent execution. This is all interesting because it's within 13 bytes. So this means that the trampoline fits within the 32 byte bundle, and this means that indirect jumps will never go inside the trampoline, they can only go the start to the trampoline. And this is what allows us to do safe exits outside of the NACL sandbox. So putting it all together, this is the API call which I started with, is loading a URL. So to do this, the untrusted code initiates it by jumping to the trampoline and saying, I, I want this to do this request. The trampoline takes it to Chrome DLL. Chrome DLL has an implementation that says, okay, native code wants to do a URL request. Well, I can't do it myself because I'm running inside the Chrome sandbox. So instead what I have to do is I have to talk to the Chrome browser via the render process. So to do that, I'm gonna need to do some inter-process communication. So it talks to the operating system and says, hey, send this bit of data 
to the render process, and then it will know what to do with it. And at that point, it's out of Knackle's control. It's just however the uh, JavaScript call would be. Same paths. That is native client in a nutshell. And I hope you all followed that, and we have questions afterwards if you don't. There's more to this. As I mentioned before, dynamic code loading in JIT, memory consistency, making the sandboxing model work, is a whole nother ball of wax. I find it very fascinating. I hope you guys look into it. Portable native client. This is the future. Uh, Bitcode, LLVM toolchain, fixes the architecture's uh, specific issues we have now, but you still can use it. You can write applications now and switch to Pinnacle when it's available. You may have noticed that nothing in this presentation really has to be inside the browser. So this is a technical solution, the uh, sandboxing, software fault isolation. There have been some projects to use the same sandboxing technology to, for instance, run computation in the cloud. Or to just say, you know, I don't want to audit this piece of code. Well, I'll just throw it in the sandbox. And that way, I know that the third party code is going to be much more contained than it would otherwise. Recommended reading. So every time we give a Knackle talk, we point people to gonackle.com. This is a developer oriented site where you download the compiler, the SDK, tutorials about how to get you started. This talk was a little more technical, more kind of research based. So we have a bunch of research papers too. I point you towards those. If you Google getting like gonackle or native client research papers, you'll get these URLs. And my favorite one is actually the tale of two ponies. So every year or so, there's a browser security contest. And uh, this year, Chrome had two exploits. One of them actually touched Knackle, but did not break it. So they used Knackle as an attack platform to hit the GPU process. And I, myself, actually learned a lot from reading this. And it's really eye-opening to see how many layers and levels you have to get through to do a modern exploit. You know, the one that involved Knackle was six, the other one was 10 is they had to chain that many different vulnerabilities together to actually get an exploit. So security, very interesting field. Strongly suggest you read that paper. Now the fun part, questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation. My pleasure. Out of all of I.O., it's probably like the most interesting and funnest one that I've ever been to, so that was really cool. I've known Knackle for about an hour and a yeah. half, so, and I was wondering, um, does it matter what version of C I use? Does Knackle care, like if, whether it's C99 or C90? Um, it doesn't even matter if you use a C compiler. Okay. So you can actually handwrite Knackle code. So it'll run. <laughs> uh, but, but we provide compilers that generate code that's compatible. Okay. So I think our version of GCC supports C99. Do you know? Yeah, I think. So you can use C99. It's whatever GCC supports, really. No. Um, the one question I had was about the indirect jumps. Yep. And um, it sounds like you are relying on the compiler to put everything on 32-bit boundary, boundaries. Yep. That seems to me like the only position where like a handwritten exploit, I mean, you were mm -hmm. assuming that all the code coming in Start it. That'll you'd allow jumps to 32 byte boundaries. But if I were to handwrite some assum that a jump into a 32 byte boundary was actually a bad execution, how do you manage that? Or validation. So oh. while we're going through looking at where what the instructions are, we record where they are too. Yeah. So internally, you can think that we have a, a bit via, a bit vector, which contains a bit for each byte. And every time we see an instruction start. We say, boom, there's a bit. Okay. So whenever we have a direct jump, we say, is the bit set there? We actually have to do this after we see all the instructions. But in the final thing, we go, okay, here's all the jump targets, here's all the instructions starts. But what about the indirect jumps into the 32 byte? We do that on the fly. So you say, okay, well, I'm parsing this instruction. I notice that it's overlapping the 32 byte boundary. Boom, oh, that's okay. bad. Okay. So you also make sure that all 32 byte boundary instructions Whatever is added 32 by boundary is also safe. Oh, yes. Okay. So it looks like you're creating a four gig memory limit again. Didn't we just get rid of that? Um, depends on how you look at it. You know, so uh, there's all sorts of devices. Uh, what you're really saying is, can I get more four gigs of memory, more than four gigs of memory? And the answer is, we could change the sandboxing model, but there'd be performance implications. So a lot of the clever things we were doing with like dropping the upper 32 bits, suddenly you're carting around eight byte constants. 
and that's a generally bad thing. So has it been a problem? And the answer is we haven't really had any developers complain about it. Uh, we've been living under the four gig limit so long that it's not been an issue. Plus, do you really want an application in your web browser consuming that much memory? Eh, most of the time not. You know, there are some applications that you in write that you five want years, to. certainly? Yeah. So sandboxing models are flexible, and once we get Tentacle running, we can take another look at well, generating a new sandboxing model or something along those lines. Kind of a related question. Uh, you, at the beginning, showed uh, x64, x86, and ARM. Yep. On uh, x86, you obviously can't do the same kind of jump constraint because you are, if you're on 32-bit x86, mm -hmm. you're, you're then limited. You're going to reduce your memory space by far more yep. and lose a very precious register. One gig. One and gig. you don't lose precious registers. Uh, we use, do something very perverse on 32-bit Intel. We use segment registers. So we're bringing back all of these things that you thought were awesome. dead. So um, for those of you who don't know, segment registers say, this is the range of memory you can use. So we say, OK, 256 megs for code, one gig for data. If you jump outside this, boom. And then we say you can't change the segment registers while you're running. This has a few weird implications. Like most people thought they were dead. So the Intel Atom processor, for instance, they didn't spend so much time supporting segment registers. They do lip service, but then when you actually use them in non-standard ways, it slows down a lot. Thanks. Hi. Um, it's a great project. I love it. Um, it is very perverse, though, in, in some ways, as you're going through all of these things. And um, I was just wondering with the, the um, what do you call it, the LLVM? thing that you're going to be doing. Yep. Does it get easier now that you control the instruction set? I mean, can you somehow do something to make this whole process simpler? Uh, define the whole process simpler. Uh, the verification process? I mean, uh, since you control kind of the intermediate format, I mean, do, is there some way to, it, Part it, of the will it become yeah. simpler when, when you get to the LLVM model? The big problem is that we can't trust the compiler. So right. we can't audit it. We can't verify that it's safe. You know, it should generate the code we want. But at the end of the day, what we do is we have to have validation be the last line of defense. So if the code doesn't look safe, we don't run it, and we make no assumptions about its provenance. So what LLVM would allow us to do is do more creative things. Right now, the binary that's shipped across the wire is something that we've stabilized, and we said this is what we're going to support. Once we start supporting bit code, then we can generate other sandboxing models. We can generate other interesting low-level things. And it decouples us and gives us a lot of flexibility. But at the bottom level, there's going to have to be some algorithm that goes through and says, does this native code look right? Yeah. And if it doesn't, out of there. And once LLVM's in the picture, it should always look right. But we aren't going to bank on that. We're going to always have the last line. W will the bit code be actual LLVM bytecode, or will you have something of your own nature? I think the plan is actual LLVM bytecode. Um, that was actually very uh, similar to the question I was going to ask was, um, uh, when you're going through the init initial uh, design um, for NACL, yeah. why did you choose native code versus, uh, versus LLVM, or you know, just comparing it to like the JVMs and what they do? OK, why choose native code instead of everything else? Yeah. Um, was it to have like a simpler? just runtime environment, not to have an actual JIT? Yep. Uh, part, of the, part of the view was compatibility, mm -hmm. as we have a lot of infrastructure for native code. Mm -hmm. So if we're just running native code, a lot of that should be analogous, fairly straightforward for to port. Um, less overhead. Mm -hmm. uh, you can access certain intrinsic instructions directly. Mm -hmm. You can do threads. You don't have to solve all these, uglies at the, uh, all these ugly issues at the VM level. Mm -hmm. Instead, you can you know, just validate it and let it rip instead of trying to have a larger surface area, mm -hmm. which you're trying to prove is safe. A part of it was also a technical issue, is we realized, hey, we can do this. Mm -hmm. So how can we bring it to the web? <coughs> so we finally realized native code doesn't have to be unsafe. And what are the opportunities? So we've been seeing a lot of people port games, for instance. And when you spend how many years writing native code and you want to port it, well, you don't want to jump through too many hoops. You can try to do weird cross-compiles into JavaScript VMs, but 
mm, it works some of the time. Uh, instead, why don't you just run the native code and then call the browser instead of the OS? That's, that's the general philosophy, is trying to keep the surface area small and trying to make it as close to other native code development as possible. Cool, thanks. I've got two questions, and I think they're both small. Uh, trampolines got me thinking, do you have any dev tools that would debug what's going on so that you can sort of see in the inspector that, okay, it's making HTTP requests and so on? Debuggers are something we're working on. They're yeah. harder than you'd expect yeah. because they've made many silly assumptions that native code just happens to work the way native code does. So the moment we start adding this R15 register to offset everything, there's been a lot of work to try to get the debuggers to get all the right symbols and I'm stuff I'm thinking like that. on a much higher level, actually. If yeah. you're coming as a web developer, looking mm -hmm. at things in the inspector, what's going on in this web page? What is it doing? Sort of, can I see what, <coughs> what stuff is it requesting on the web? Yes. At like the I'm moment, uh, half and half. So okay. whenever you're doing a pepper call, that usually gets traced. So every time you see like a URL load, Chrome has the console of all network activity. Awesome. and it'll get logged in that. So you're mediating through the browser, yeah, so all the instrumentation the browser has. What's actually going on inside the native process is a little more opaque than I'd like at this point, point. Yeah. and we're thinking about ways to expose health and metrics and pull that out of the process. That's awesome. Uh, the second question is, so you're defending against all these things that are unsafe from a systems perspective, but are you having any checks and bounds on stuff that's causing infinite loops that just eat the CPU? Nope. That kind of stuff? Um, this is similar to a question before last. Once you move into the LLVM world and you're sending um, basically virtual machine instructions mm -hmm. and calling a limited API, um, how would you say that Pinnacle would compare to Java or uh, .NET? Uh, one thing about LLVM is it's a bit misnamed. So the virtual machine name came earlier in its life cycle. And it's more a compiler IR than it is, strictly speaking, a VM. There's some architecture-specific things that have got leaked into it, which have had to be hammered out in order to use it as an interchange format. So how would bytecode compare against VMs? And it's an interesting question. I think the only real answer added to that is surface area, is securing a VM is going to be much harder than you know, validating native code and just use the model that's there. And the VM will likely be slower, give or take, uh, just-in-time compilers, how well those do. So does the validator in um, Pinnacle work on native code still, or is it validating LLVM code? Um, we validate all native code before we run it. So Pinnacle, you can think of as largely a translator, which says, I'm going to take this bit code, then turn it into mach uh, machine code. And then we pass it off to the validator. The validator says, OK, you did your job right. and good to go. Thanks. Have you done any uh, benchmarking on the difference between un, uh, the unmodified code that you do, like adding padding and replacing things with pseudo instructions versus the modified version? Yes. And the, what are the results? <laughs> Um, it depends. Also, one of these horrible answers. I'm not trying to weasel out, but the truth is it does depend. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing a numerical application, for instance, you're not going to have a lot of jumps. You know, you're not going to have a lot of calls, so you can usually rip through those instructions. But certain benchmarks, which are doing indirect jumps all over the place, you're going to get uh, no-op padding. You're going to get a bunch of guard instructions. And on 32-bit, because we're using segment registers, it's actually more efficient. So I think on 32-bit, it's like, 10, 20% slowdown compared to full native speed. On 64-bit, our guard sequences are a little more complex. They take up more bytes, a few more instructions here and there. And I'm not exactly sure what the benchmarks are. Again, I say rule of thumb 20%, although on some degenerate benchmarks, it's like down 40, 50%, just because the way the code works out. Um, again, the answer is, is that no one's complained yet, either. So <laughs> it, it works as intended. Thanks. Another uh, pinnacle question. Uh, since you have, you're going to have LLVM uh, living in, in pinnacle to uh, uh, generate the instructions, you mentioned earlier that you can still do JITs in uh, native client. I 
sort of thinking about some ways in which you could do that. Mm -hmm. Are you going to expose the LVM uh, translator to applications so that they can just use that instead of having another copy of LVM inside to do jitting? Um, interesting question. Very interesting question that I can't answer because I'm not working on the Pinnacle project. Okay. So what they're working on there. But you can imagine all the complexities of, well, since we can't trust the translator, you know, how do we fit it in so we can run it in an untrusted capacity? So one neat thing I didn't mention is that um, the actual ahead of time translator is implemented inside of native client. So we have the LLVM compiler running inside the native client, san client sandbox to produce code that then we run inside the native client sandbox. Thanks. Standard technique for presentations is wait a few seconds. Usually someone gets uncomfortable, stands up, asks another question. If that doesn't work, then you say, okay, thanks for coming.